let's take a look at the world's most popular military transport, the C-130 Hercules. The C-130 Hercules is an American-built, four-engine, turboprop transport aircraft designed for operations out of unprepared runways and has been in continuous service for over 60 years. Originally intended as a military troop, cargo, or medevac transport, the operators of the C-130 have expanded its use into dozens of other roles, ranging from gunship to scientific research support. With over 60 variants in use by more than 60 countries, the C-130 is perhaps the most successful transport aircraft ever. Notable features include four turboprop engines, an aft cargo loading ramp, and a multi-windowed cockpit. Let's take a look at some key specifications for the C-130. Length, 97 feet 9 inches. Height, 38 feet 3 inches. Wingspan, 132 feet 7 inches. Maximum speed, 320 knots. Empty weight, 75,800 pounds. Maximum takeoff weight, 155,000 pounds. Payload, 42,000 pounds. Range, 2,050 nautical miles. Engines, each Allison T56A15 turboprop generates 4,590 shaft horsepower. Takeoff distance, 3,586 feet at 155,000 pounds or 1,400 feet at 80,000 pounds. During the Korean War, it was found that existing World War II era piston transports such as the C-47 Skytrain, the C-46 Commando, and C-119 Flying Boxcar were no longer sufficient. In 1951, the Air Force issued requirements for a new transport. The requirements were sent to Boeing, Chase, Lockheed, Douglas, Fairchild, North American, and several other aerospace manufacturers, and stated that the new transport should have capacity for 92 passengers or 64 paratroopers, be able to operate from unprepared airstrips, carry bulky equipment such as artillery pieces, and fly with one engine out. Unlike previous transport designs, the new aircraft would be designed from the ground up as a combat transport, with a large loading ramp at the rear of the fuselage. Five of the companies submitted designs, including Lockheed, who eventually won the contract. Incredibly, the Lockheed design came close to not even being submitted. Known internally as Model 82, Lockheed's team was led by Willis Hawkins, who put together a design model in just over two months. When asked how he came up with the design, Willis stated, we basically took the dimensions of the biggest piece of equipment the Air Force specified, drew a circle around its cross-section, and turned the circle into a tube about the length of a railroad boxcar. We put wings, a nose, and a tail on it, and we had the design. Adding, we put the aircraft low to the ground so we could use the ramp to get cargo on and off easily. Willis then presented the model to his boss, Hal Hibbard. Hibbard ran the design by Kelly Johnson, an even then legendary designer who would be credited with several revolutionary aircraft including the P-38 Lightning, F-104 Starfighter, U-2, and SR-71. Johnson looked at the model and told Hibbard, if you sign that letter, you will destroy the Lockheed Company. Johnson at the time was working on what would become the F-104 and was apparently only interested in higher speeds and altitudes, not a slow-flying transport. Willis, in turn, told Hibbard, if this design is really as terrible as Kelly Johnson says it is, the Air Force will think that too, and they'll give the contract to somebody else. I think we ought to submit the proposal. And with that, Lockheed submitted the Model 82 as their entry. In July of 1951, the Air Force awarded the contract to Lockheed and designated the new aircraft the YC-130, which first flew in August of 1954 out of Edwards Air Force Base. The flight lasted 61 minutes while being piloted by Stanley Belts and Roy Wimmer. Incredibly, the YC-130 took off in only 800 feet and met or exceeded all Air Force requirements. Interestingly, the chase plane for this flight was a P-2V Neptune with Kelly Johnson on board. Following the completion of the two prototypes, the C-130 began production in Marietta, Georgia, where C-130s are still being produced today some 64 years later. After a naming contest, the name Hercules was chosen and is still in use, 
although the C-130 has earned many other nicknames in its long run. The C-130A was the first production variant and had three-bladed propellers and was powered by the Allison T-56 turboprop engine. The T-56 was designed for the C-130 and has had some 18,000 examples built while logging over 200 million flying hours. In 1958, the Marines obtained KC-130s, an aerial refueling variant of the C-130. The KC-130 makes use of a removable external fuel tank in the cargo bay, which adds 3,600 gallons of fuel capacity and allows refueling of two aircraft simultaneously. The C-130B was introduced in 1959 and added an AC electrical system, increased fuel capacity, and four-bladed propellers. By 1962, an extended range version of the C-130 was introduced, designated the C-130E. The E model incorporated two 1,360-gallon Sergeant Fletcher external fuel tanks under each wing, upgrades to the avionics, structural improvements, and a higher gross weight. Along with this, the engines were upgraded to the more powerful Allison T56A7A turboprops. In 1978, the C-130H model updated the engines further, this time with Allison T56A15s. Additionally, the outer wing was redesigned along with further updates to the avionics. In 1995, the Allison company was acquired by Rolls-Royce, and in 1999, the latest production version was introduced as the C-130J, which added six bladed composite propellers along with the Rolls-Royce AE2100D3 turboprop engine and further avionics enhancements. Next, we will take a look at some notable moments in the C-130's long operational history. Given their versatility, ease of maintenance, and ability to operate out of almost any airfield, it should come as no surprise the C-130 has been involved in many historic missions and milestones, both conventional and covert. Some notable examples include, in 1963, a C-130 obtained a world record that still stands today the largest and heaviest aircraft to land on an aircraft carrier. A Marine Corps KC-130 landed on the USS Forrestal, not just once, but conducted 29 touch-and-go landings, 21 unassisted full-stop landings, and 21 unassisted takeoffs. Humorously, the words, Look Ma, No Hook, were painted on the side of the KC-130. Landing and takeoff weights were between 85,000 and 121,000 pounds. In 1964, C-130s began participating as Forward Air Controllers, or FACs, over the Ho Chi Minh Trail along the Laos-Vietnam border in support of American strike aircraft. Later, in 1964, C-130s operating with the 302nd Air Division conducted a dramatic mission in the Belgian Congo which involved Belgian paratroopers being dropped, air-landed, and airlifted to rescue trapped hostages in Stanleyville, who were being held by Communist Simba forces. This mission resulted in the awarding of the prestigious McKay Trophies to the C-130 crews. During the Indo-Pakistani War of 1965, C-130s belonging to the Pakistan Air Force were modified and used as bombers. This was done by using pallets which held up to 20,000 pounds of bombs. The pallets were then rolled off the open cargo ramp and used on Indian targets such as tank formations, bridges, and artillery positions. Some C-130s were modified as flying anti-aircraft positions, with AA guns fitted to the ramp. Apparently this was effective as claims were made of 17 shootdowns and 16 other enemy aircraft damaged by this technique. During the late 1960s, C-130s were also used in covert operations to ascertain Chinese nuclear capabilities. The CIA planned an operation codenamed Heavy T. Heavy T called for battery-powered sensors to be dropped at low altitude near a suspected Chinese nuclear weapons test base at Lopnur. The Republic of China or Taiwanese Air Force pilots of Black Hat Squadron, who normally flew U-2 spy planes, were trained to fly the C-130. In a night mission that lasted over 12 hours at low altitude, the sensor pallets were successfully dropped and relayed intelligence data for six months until the batteries failed. In 1976, Israeli commandos conducted a daring and successful counter-terrorist rescue operation codenamed Operation Thunderbolt. 106 passengers of an Air France flight were being held in Uganda by Palestinian and German terrorists, where the aircraft had been diverted to after being taken over. 
The plan involved 200 soldiers, jeeps, and a black Mercedes-Benz made to resemble that of the then Ugandan dictator. The ingress and egress flights of four C-130s was flown almost entirely below 100 feet and were 2,200 nautical miles each way. 102 of the 106 passengers were rescued. However, the commando's leader, Lt. Col. Yonathan Netanyahu, was killed. Yonathan was the older brother of current Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and Operation Thunderbolt has been retroactively referred to as Operation Yonathan in his memory. The C-130 is operated by so many nations that sometimes it has found itself on both sides of a conflict. For example, during the 1982 Falklands War, Argentine Air Force C-130s flew night resupply missions acting as blockade runners to the Argentine garrison on the Falkland Islands. Argentine C-130s also flew daytime maritime survey and reconnaissance flights along with aerial refueling missions to refuel their A-4 Skyhawks and Dassault Super Entidards. During the conflict, one Argentine C-130 was shot down by a Royal Navy Sea Harrier. On the other side of the conflict, the British used RAF C-130s to support their logistical efforts. In the 1991 Gulf War, an MC-130 combat talent aircraft dropped some of the largest conventional bombs in the world. The 15,000-pound BL-82 Daisy Cutter, which was released from the cargo ramp using drug shoots. And, since 1992, the C-130 has been used as the support aircraft for the Blue Angels, affectionately named Fat Albert. Interestingly, Fat Albert supports a Navy squadron, but is flown and maintained exclusively by the U.S. Marines. The AC-130 holds the current record for the longest sustained flight by any C-130, 36 hours. This was accomplished in 1997 by two AC-130U gunships flying from Hurlburt Field to Daegu, South Korea. The flight involves seven air-to-air refuelings. Starting in 2001, C-130s have participated heavily in operations in Afghanistan and in the 2003 Operation Iraqi Freedom. C-130s continue extensive operations all over the globe today. Additionally, C-130s have also participated in numerous humanitarian missions, aerial firefighting efforts, maritime patrols, and other operations. The amount of applications a C-130 has been tasked with is amazing, along with its many variants of this venerable and successful aircraft. Let me know in the comments below if there is a particular application or variant of the C-130 you'd like to see a video on. Next, we'll take a look at operators of the C-130. Incredibly, it may be easier to list the countries that do not operate the C-130 versus the ones that do. This global map indicates the nations that currently or formerly operated the C-130. The C-130 is truly a global aircraft. Some examples of operators include the United States, Egypt, South Africa, Israel, Indonesia, Japan, the Philippines, Singapore, France, Spain, Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom. For an aircraft that came close to not being submitted to an Air Force proposal, the C-130 has blazed an amazing trail. With over 60 years of continuous service with its original primary customer, the United States Air Force, the C-130 shows no signs of slowing down and will likely be flying into the 2040s. Loved by its air crews, maintainers, and those who have ridden in or jumped out of them, the C-130 Hercules is a legend in aviation. What do you think? Is the C-130 the greatest transport aircraft of all time? How long will it serve? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, go ahead and subscribe and click the bell for notifications. If you'd like to support this channel and help me make more videos like this one, become a Patreon where you will get exclusive behind the scenes videos and other perks. I'll leave a link in the description below. Stay safe and see you next time.